Okay, so Keith set the scene very well for me actually from the preclinical perspective. I'm a medical physicist by training, so I've been hoping to give you sort of a, a similar overview, but perhaps looking back from the perspective of a clinical drug development team, what we want to do, where the challenges are, and give you some, some examples. So I'll just start with inevitable disclosures. It's actually quite useful for me because it knows me introduce myself a little bit. I've been at um, GSK just about, just about a year now. And then before that, I was an independent consultant working for a number of clients across the pharmaceutical industry and, and some non-profit ma making organizations as well. And I, it's useful just to see that list because you'll see I'm going to use a number of examples from that, that period with, with permission um, to illustrate some of, some of the points. And before that, I was at Pfizer in Sandwich, so fairly well-trodden um, path. So what I'm going to talk about, I think it's worth just thinking about what, what our motivation is for wanting to use EG at all. You know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, Keith already talked about the role of biomarkers, and I'm just going to come at that from a slightly different angle quite quickly. And then talk about where we might want to apply EG. And I think, again, we've heard some of this, this before, but, but, but using a simple pharma pharmacodynamic biomarker and then multivariate approaches um, to take that a little bit further. And I think we can come up with some, hopefully, some quite simple conclusions. So... There are an awful lot of different papers and slides I could put up to say how dire the pharmaceutical industry state is. I quite like this one. Um, so this is uh, a plot against uh, time of the number of drugs per billion dollars of um, R&D spending that have been approved. It sort of looks like a monotonic decline, but note the log scale. So it's actually probably slightly worse than it looks at first glance. So we, we do need to, uh, to do something uh, with that. The, I guess somebody said to me once, well, the advantage of a log scale is you can never reach zero. I suppose that's true. Um, <laughs> Okay, so what's causing that? Well, again, there's a lot of analyses out there. I'm just going to present one. Uh, so this is a paper by, by Paul et al. in 2010, where they did a parametric sensitivity analysis um, around the different stages of drug development and said, well, if we can improve or if, we, if one of these gets better or gets worse, what's the overall effect on the capitalised cost per launch? This basically tells us, allowing for all the failures that we have, uh, what's the cost of getting one drug to market? And I'm not going to dwell on all the numbers, but the, the key point here is that the top one, with quite a much bigger, you know, much bigger bar than the other, is um, the probability of technical success in phase two. And what that's telling us is that if we can improve the technical success in phase two, that will have a, you know, a very big um, impact. And phase two is typically where you do your first efficacy assessments in, in humans. So what that means is can we predict better which drugs are, gonna, are likely to, to be efficacious when they get to phase two and hopefully throw away some that, some that aren't. So how might we do that in practice? Well, this is a, a sort of a, a flow diagram of typical drug development um, programs, so in a you know, very, very cartoon fashion. So we've heard about all the preclinical work that you can do just now. So we can look at PD, we can look at proof of mechanism, we can look at various models of disease. In the clinic, we, we do a, typically a phase one study, which would be basically safety starting in healthy volunteers. And then we'd go into this phase two study where we start to look at efficacy. Now, what we'd propose here is perhaps that we could include a biomarker study um, to try to get a better idea of the likelihood of success and throw away um, drugs that don't, and that would give us essentially um, three decisions. So either a normal go if we've got a reasonable level of confidence, a stop if we don't think there's any reason to proceed, or a possibly an accelerated go if we have a higher level of confidence than usual. And again, what we need to do in this biomarker is really the same kind of things we've heard about preclinically. So, so proof of pharmacology, pharmacodynamics, proof of mechanism or efficacy prediction, and that could be model based on mechanistic work in healthy volunteers, or it could be something in patients. And I'll come back to some examples. It's worth just bearing in mind that, I mean, I've shown this as a separate box, but it's usually possible to combine the biomarker study with, with the others in some way. So, so typically you might actually be able to do some EEG within your phase one study or so, just to make it all a bit cheaper and a bit, a bit quicker. So again, I won't, won't dwell on that too much, but it gives you an idea of what we're, you know, what we're trying to achieve at this phase one to phase two interface. An important question I always get asked in the, in the, you know, in, in the company is, well, okay, we're going to add this extra study. Does it make economic sense to do that? And I've stolen or, well, adapted with permission uh, from um, Richard Wise and Cliff Preston, um, who read a paper about um, fMRI looking at this problem. So they did some economic modeling where they looked at um, effectively what happens if you do exactly this. So they started with 10 compounds um, going into a proof of concept study and assumed th these are sort of noddy numbers, but, but they, they, they make the point. So they assumed a cost of $20 million each with 10 projects going into so that's 200 in total. Assumed that two out of those 10 are successful and goes, go into a phase 2B study um, with a cost of 200 each, that's 400, and then one gets to market. And so if you follow that through, that gives you a total cost of getting that one drug to market of, of $600 million, given their, given their sort of approximate um, 
illustrative numbers. Now, if I put the biomarker um, study in here, we start with exactly the same. We do um, 10 projects going into a biomarker study, assuming that's, that's about $2 million. We assume that that screens out six of them, and that's, these are sort of reasonably real numbers. We assume that six of those get screened out because we decide they're not likely to succeed, and we take uh, only four forward into the proof of concept, two, two into the phase 2b, and then one again comes to market. So your overall success rate is exactly the same. All you've done is put this screening step in to get rid of the, sort of the, the, the no-hopers, as you might call them. And the, the upshot there is that one project succeeds, but this time the cost is 500 million. So it does just illustrate that actually doing more work up front can, um, can actually end up, end up cheaper. It's obviously a bit more complicated than that, because if, if you delay getting the product to market, that reduces revenues. And we can, we can, we can talk about that for, for, for a long time, but hopefully it illustrates the point that it's not adding an extra study isn't necessarily a, a stupid thing to do. So, the thing I want to talk about, and again, we've talked about this a little bit, um, or Keith talked about this a little bit, is uh, fundamental PKPD principles. So there was a review paper um, in uh, Drug Discovery Today a few years ago, and the dates dropped off the bottom of that, I think it was 2010, um, written, written by uh, colleagues at Pfizer, where they looked at 44 phase two drug development projects and examined all of them based on three principles, which, which became called the three pillars. And these, these effectively, so pillar one is, is confirming exposure at the target site of action. So basically that is, is your drug getting into the right compartment. So in the case of CNS, it would be is your drug in the brain. Um, pillar two is binding the pharmacological target. And pillar three is expression of pharmacology. So basically, is it there? Has it bound? And is it doing something? And to summarize the, the data from these 44 studies, they, they um, combined these. So they, they looked at exposure confidence based on pillars one and two, and pharmacology confidence based on pillars two and three, and plotted these on, uh, on a graph, um, you know, sort of a, a bar chart. And so exposure competence is, is up, the, up the vertical um, axis, and pharmacology competence along the horizontal. And Effectively, they, they split between the, between the four quadrants. So 14 of the 44 had had all the pillars tested. And you can see in, in, um, in the text here what, what happened to those. But I think the key point really is that towards the top right, the success rates were much higher. So effectively, if you'd got good confidence that the drug was in the, you know, at the target, binding and doing something, the proof of concept success rate was 86% compared to sort of zero down here and 17 where you'd only got, got, got some evidence on pillars, um, pillars one and two. And just as importantly, in the, in the ones that failed here, you could be confident that you'd tested the mechanism and therefore it wasn't worth pursuing another drug to, te to, to target the same mechanism for that indication. So I think it illustrates that actually these very simple questions are, are very useful to, to, to answer. So bottom line of, of all that is that, you know, pharmaceutical industry, we need to make better use of biomarkers to um, enable earlier go, no, good, no go decisions in drugs that are under development. Stopping drugs that aren't going to be successful earlier saves significant um, uh, money and effort. And prioritizing drugs that will be successful maximizes revenues because we get them to market earlier. We can do a lot by using biomarkers to um, answer very simple questions. So distribution to the relevant tissue and engagement of the target. Pharmacological modulation of the activity um, mediated by the targets. So this is some, some kind of um, a PD readout. And then potentially also non-registration or registration endpoints that predict efficacy if we take that to the next level. The other thing that's worth being, bearing in mind, and again, Keith's covered this already, is that uh, you know, if, we, if we've got some translational biomarkers, we can do earlier screening in animal models. And we can also th then take that confirmation through into humans before we even get into phase two with any luck. So, so translation is very important. Now, I like this, this diagram of EG. I put this up quite a lot. And as a physicist, the, the reason I put it up um, is I don't understand it at all. Um, but it just, it just illustrates to me how complex the EEG signals we're actually getting out as a readout are. And the, 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 the way I use this with drug development teams is to say, well, Actually, if you start trying to tell me that you know, the, the, the beta change you're seeing on your EEG is to do with one particular circuit, I probably don't believe that. You know, it's much more complex. The brain's a network. And so what it drives me towards is a much more empirical um, approach to the analysis and saying, well, actually, if we've measured something preclinically, uh, an EEG change preclinically, and we believe that's going to translate, surely that's the best way of generating a clinical hypothesis to test. <coughs> Because in the pre, you know, in the preclinical species, we can do a load of other stuff to confirm we're doing what we think we're doing. It's worth just thinking about what's the status of EEG at the moment. And there's a there's a review paper that that um, I wrote with some other people in in 2014, um, and I think 
you know, we came together as a pre-competitive group and you know, the overall view was that despite being, you know, having a lot of potential of being long-standing, EG isn't being used as routinely as, as much as it, it, uh, it could be in drug development, particularly in the clinic. And it's worth thinking about why. So we, yeah, the, the reasons we came up with were it's lack of standardization, st lack of standardization of both recording and analysis, which makes meta-analysis and um, data pulling from the literature problematic, an incomplete knowledge of translatability between species, some disbelief in the technique based on past failures, and I think this is perhaps around over-promising and saying, well, actually, this particular change matches one particular um, receptor or, 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 or something like that. Um, and then it also, I think, advances in neuroimaging techniques. So in some ways, some, some clinical people particularly were seeing EEG as a poor man's imaging tool, which diverts it away from its strengths, which are the high temporal resolution and being able to do different things. I need to update the last bullet, actually, because I've just learned this morning uh, the pre-competitive collaboration IPEC. It was underway. Unfortunately, that's folded now. Um, but I think that's an opportunity is to deal with some of these standardization issues. I think a pre-competitive initiative was, was being discussed and was making some headway. And I think that's a real opportunity lost, actually, and something perhaps we can talk this afternoon about rekindling. So what we proposed in this paper is when would we uh, use pharmaco EG as a P uh, just as a simple PD biomarker. And it's, uh, it's very simple, really is uh, when you had some preclinical experiments that produce a robust result and you'd expect that um, the change that you see would, would translate. And a, sort of a clear example there is if you're seeing a, a hippocampally driven theta signal in a rat model, you wouldn't expect to measure that in the clinic because of the depth of the hippocampus. You just wouldn't pick it up on scalp EEG. So that's a really good example of where you wouldn't pursue that. Um, and as our knowledge of translatability, translatability improves, that would, that, would, that would get better. Then you'd design a clinical study to um, test for the expected effect with the other pharmacology measures as, as secondary endpoints. And that leads you into a decision tree. Clinical teams like decision trees. Okay, so this is sort of a typical example of, of, of what, we might, um, what we might look at. So you'd look at, um, is your EG quality control, your PK results, your positive control as expected. Then you'd look at your primary endpoint. If it's positive, that gives you um, confirmation that your project can continue. If it's, uh, if it's not, you can look at the secondary endpoints and maybe do a re-evaluation. If you see absolutely nothing on the EEG, sorry, the um, conclusion would then be that the central pharmacology is not demonstrated and you'd put the project on hold pending any other data. So yeah, I think we can have quite a clear decision tree if we follow this, this approach. And if you go back to the paper, there are a number of examples that we took from the literature looking to see whether this, this would work retrospectively. <coughs> now, one of the other things I wanted to talk about was, was multivariate analysis and moving, moving some of these techniques forward. So classical um, QEG, I'm sure I don't need to explain to uh, people here, effectively um, involves looking at power spectra and dividing into the standard sort of frequency bands that we all talk about, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma, and using various quantities um, from those. And that works very well. So uh, you know, we had the lorazepam example earlier, but you know, benzodiazepines are a very famous example where complex PKPD modeling of resting EG data works very well. I'm not going to talk about the equations, but you can see the, the fit of the models. And this has been around for, for years and it works very well. But we always seem to run into trouble when we extend it to another mechanism. Um, and I think it's just because we have a much more complex interplay between what's happening in the EG and the mechanism that we're targeting. So what are the problems with this classical analysis from our point of view? Well, again, drug development teams like to have one number. They want a, a single endpoint or they want a single classifier. And this is really the opposite of that. So there's numerous potential endpoints, hundreds of thousands, because you've got 90 normal electro positions, five frequency bands, absolute relative power values, power ratios, coherence measures, and so on. The individual endpoints themselves lack specificity. The readout will often be dependent on POTOC interpretation, and therefore we struggle to define a priori criteria for clear decisions. So one way of, of, of dealing with that is to look at multivariate approaches. And I'm just going to talk about one that we developed. Um, so this was led by Phil Brain, who was a, stati who was, was a statistician at Pfizer in Sandwich when I was down there, and, and the rest of that team, which we called uh, ge uh, Generalized Semilinear Canonical Correlation Analysis, or GSLCCA for short. And what this does, very briefly, is it uses the whole spectrum without dividing it into bands. It uses the entire recording duration, so of specifying um, certain time points, and it uses all the electrodes. And what it provides is some interpretable mechanistic information, which we'll talk about in a minute, and also a, a, a continuous PD measure. And the assumption that underpins it is that you assume you've got a PD profile of a known form. So that's an equation with given parameters. So it might be the difference of two exponentials for a, an ORI um, administered compound, for example. So how does it work in principle? Well, the assumption is that you have a power spectrum at time t, and obviously you have a number of these at different time points. 
and that there exists a signature, and this is basically a waiting function, which is a multiplying function for this, that links the power spectrum at time t to one point on your PD response at the same time. So in effect, if you multiply this power spectrum by the waiting function and integrate over all time, that gives you a number which corresponds to the x on here, and obviously you can do that for all, all times. And the way this works is you, you assume the form of this equation, but you don't know the parameters, and you run an iterative process using the canonical correlation analysis to generate both the ideal modelled curve, the real data, and also this signature, which gives you, tells you something about mechanism, because what you, you can tell from the positive or negative weighting which parts of the spectrum are shifting. So just a very quick example of how it works. This was a study run at, run at um, uh, Cardiff University that we, we, re, we analysed retrospectively. So it was a clinical study with Remy Fentanyl. So we did a baseline uh, recording, a steady state infusion, and then a washout. And by applying um, an equation that looks like this for your, your PD um, uh, model form, and then um, running that through the model, these are results for 12 subjects. So you can see that you are following, so that the solid lines here are the, mod, are the modeled equation and the dots are the real time points. So you can see that you are picking out quite well um, the, the, the PD um, output. And the mean T50, uh, mean half-life here came out as about three minutes, which matches very well with what you'd expect from the, from the PK. So it seems to be working, working very nicely. So that's one quick example. This is out there on our forge if anyone wants to use it, um, and it's described in the two papers. If anyone wants, wants any more information, please give me a, a shout, but yeah, it, it's there and, and available to use. The other approach I'm going to talk about is taking this to the next step. So this is around um, some of the things that Keith talked about is can we, as well as doing PD, can we take this to the next step and start to predict efficacy or provide even some kind of surrogate biomarker? And one of my consultancy clients, Mentis Cura, have been working in this, this area around dementia in particular, but also ADHD and some other conditions for um, some time. I thought it's worth just um, illustrating this, you know, what's possible with some of the, the, the work that they've been doing. So in effect, they apply uh, statistical pattern recognition and machine learning techniques to EEG. So they start off by doing a standard analysis which reduces all the available features. Then they use a genetic algorithm to select the relevant features and follow that with a support vector machine classification. So what you can then do is you, by using appropriate reference data sets you can train these algorithms to provide two things. So one is that a probability that the subject's EEG belongs to one group or another, and that could be two different pathologies. So it might be Alzheimer's disease or a healthy control, and I'll give you some examples in a minute. And the other is an index that correlates with a specific aspect. And again, I'll give you uh, an example of that in a moment. But the key point for me is this, this approach intrinsically produces a single output measure, which is exactly what we want from a clinical decision-making point of view. So just to illustrate how that works, they, they, they do a standard um, uh, Fourier transform type analysis and evaluate the classical endpoints and in their usual analysis they end up with 1,120 features which they take into the genetic algorithm and the support vector machine to generate a classifier and then also this index. So you know, they won't go into the mathematical details, they're in some of the, in some of the papers, um, but the point here is it's entirely data driven. So one example um, of, uh, of a, an index they developed is the cholinergic index. Um, the way they did that was they trained the algorithms using data from healthy elderly subjects before and after administration of scopolamine, which in induces a cholinergic deficit. And then having developed those classifiers, they then applied the classifiers to AD and other dementia patients, and then also tried using them to uh, monitor disease response. And the, the, you know, the hypothesis there is that some improvements in cholinergic activity is essential to treatment of dementia, regardless really of the, the, the mechanism. So, this gives you, uh, this, this explains the development of the index. So this is um, a distribution of the cholinergic index that, uh, that comes out once you've developed the classifier um, with the uh, subjects before in blue and after in red, the scopolamine um, injection. So you can see here that the, basically the, the classifiers worked and you're getting two distributions there um, that, that are separated. What happens, and this is, this is another recently published paper, so what happens when you, um, look at controls versus different dementia groups. I'm afraid the numbers are not terribly legible, but if we look at the box plots, um, what we've got here is the cholinergic index. These are normal controls. These are stable MCI patients. These are prodromal AD, so these are the initial baseline recordings for subjects that were followed up for, I think, five years and ended up 
developing AD. So this is basically saying, well, these patients were actually lower than the stable MCIs once we knew the outcome. These are AD, and these are um, combination Lewy body Parkinson's um, disease patients. So again, we're seeing quite a, a nice separation and, and, and a progression uh, through the normal stable MCI, PAD, and AD. And what this ends up with, so they, they, they obviously, they, a lot of their work is geared towards clinical practice. So they produce something called the Mentis Cura Report, which has something called a dementia gram. So that's the other part of this, which is the classification. So, it's, um, so for any given subject, what you get when you do the analysis is you get some probabilities of which group the um, patient is in uh, on the basis of pairwise comparisons. And so what this says here is that this patient... Um, this patient, um, in this case, is 91% is likely to be MCI compared to normal, and so on. So each of these is a pairwise comparison, and obviously they track, um, they track across, so they're, they're symmetrical diagonally. And what they do then is they multiply up the, um, the pairwise comparison to give an overall DGW, or dementia gram weight, which gives you an overall EG-based diagnosis, if you like, of the uh, of, of which category the patients should fall into. This one quite clearly looks as if they're in the Lewy body Parkinson's dementia group when you take all this um, into account. So hopefully that, that explains that um, a little bit. It's, it's quite difficult to explain quickly. Um, the other part of that is you look at that they will also measure the cholinergic index and that gives you the, the monitor for disease progression. So if you see a patient several times over say a course of five years, you can see how that, how that changes. So rattle through that a little bit, but I think the, the key conclusions are actually quite clear and very much in line with, with, with the earlier talk. So, you know, biomarkers are an essential part of the answer to the attrition problem in early drug development. Answers to simple questions like, has the drug entered the brain and is it doing something, can have a big impact on decision making and sort of the financial bottom line for us. But it's important that those decisions are always evidence-based, ideally using a predefined hypothesis or prior data. And this is where the understanding of translatability comes in so that you can define a clinical hypothesis in advance. And then there's, I think there's quite a lot of promise uh, around these advanced multivariate techniques, which I think can increase the utility of EEG and other neuroimaging techniques to improve decision-making um, you know, and obviously answer the earlier two questions. And that's all I had to say. Hopefully that's helpful. Right, so the question was, um, if you have a system based on predefined classes, how robust does it become when you might change those? And I think, are you leading to the Mentis Cura kind of work? So, so I, think, I think it's as good as the data you put in is the answer. So if your training data sets are pretty robust, and I don't think I gave you the numbers there, but the Mentis Cura are now into, well into the hundreds in most of those groups. I think some of them are a bit rarer, perhaps just getting, getting towards the hundred. But I think as those groups grow, it becomes more and more robust. Um, I'm not sure if that quite answers. Yes, I, mean, I, think, I think it's all to do with the, the quality and the amount of data that you put in to translate the classifiers. So it, it depends at some point on the clinical decision that's been made earlier on. Exactly, but I think you can then take it to another level, and I didn't, didn't put this in for lack of time, but, but actually you can then start to say, well, if we've developed this classifier based on large numbers, where you assume that actually because of the numbers we're getting the majority of the diagnoses right, if we then look at a big group who've all been called AD, you might actually prune out some who weren't really AD based on the EEG, and there's some evidence that that works as well. So, so yeah, you're absolutely right. What's the gold standard? Is it clinical diagnosis? And it, it might not be, actually, in, in some cases. Okay, so there were two questions there. So one is if you give um, anticholinergic drugs to the patients, does the cholinergic index improve? And the answer is yes. I think that's been that's in one of the papers, I think. If it's not, it's a publication that's pending. So that, that's quite a simple one. In terms of the, the other part of the question for people online was if you do amyloid beta PET, is there any correlation there? And I'm not aware that, that that's been looked at with this particular technique. Yeah. yeah, so the answer there was how robust are the classifiers? Have we replicated or have Mentis Cura replicated them in different environments and, and so on? And I must admit, when I first started working with them, that was one of my concerns because virtually all their data was from Iceland, which is a pretty restricted gene pool for a start. I think there's 300,000 people is the total population of Iceland. So that was a worry. But they have rolled that out now. So they, they work um, in, across the Scandinavian countries. They've also got clinics in Germany. And I think as experience grows, it sounds like a sales pitch for Mentis Cure, but as, as experience grows, I think we gain confidence. Um, but yes, yeah, so they are implementing it in different countries, different EEG labs, and they offer an online um, data analysis service now. So anybody can send in a data set and get the dementia gram and the report that I showed you back. 
So it's expanding, and I think you'll only gain that confidence through use. Yeah, so the question there is, have, have any patients been trapped as they progress? And, and actually, they do have a very big database there uh, with, with follow-up EEG recordings. I sh some of the results I showed you made use of that follow-up in the sense that we were able to know that we had a baseline that was somebody who was either going to develop Alzheimer's or stay stable MCI. So we've already used that. I think um, they also have periodic EEGs. What I'm not sure is what that data looks like, and I don't think that's been published as yet. But, but certainly that data exists, and again, it's building. Thank you.